Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Pixel Chatter number 12. Wow, we're starting to get through these Pixel Chatters. Uh, hopefully you're looking forward to a big show today. We've got some good stuff on. I'm even going to show you how I go about cleaning my camera sensors today, which is a question that I get asked all the time. So we're going to peel back the curtains and you're going to see how we get rid of those dust bunnies because I think a lot of people <laughs> want to know how to do that. It's been a good couple of weeks, lots of great things going on. Uh, went away last weekend and uh, went up north and got a few new photos, did a few new vlogs. Uh, you saw the first one of those come out last Wednesday, which was uh, Catherine Hill Bay. Um, a couple more to come from that weekend, which is really cool. Looking forward to that. Let's jump over into the chat and see who's in there. Who have we got? G'day Brian, g'day Barracuda. Sam Allen, good morning. Good to see you here. Who else we got in the chat box? Say g'day, let us know where you are, what the weather's like what you're planning on shooting this weekend, stick it all in that box. Let us know what's going on. G'day, Tommy, how are you? Yes, it's a good morning for a cup of coffee. Alrighty. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, vacation it was only a few days. Um, in a couple of weeks, I've got a, uh, a much bigger trip coming along uh, where I will be, I reckon, doing maybe six or seven sunrise and sunset shoots so a big week away which is pretty cool oh barracuda is nathan with all the emails <laughs> hey g'day nathan got one of your images for critique today yeah? uh, nathan uh keith g'day from china wayne in nz g'day wayne hobart very cold very wet and definitely a good morning for a coffee yeah you know what um doesn't surprise me that it's cold down there Wet. We've just had such a marvellous winter in Sydney. The weather here has been amazing. So, Gianna, good morning. Who else we got there? How are you, Wayne from NZ? I want to get back to New Zealand. I want to go do the South Island some more with my camera. Uh, really looking forward to that. All right, let's get stuck into the show. Um, some cool things we need to cover off. Perth is cold and wet, is it? <laughs> Oh, there's Ren. G'day, Ren. Anthony. G'day, Anthony. Jumping in from uh, Melbourne. Ian, good evening. John from Cronulla. G'day, John. Yeah. Good to see so many people jumping in at the beginning of the show. Um, so, yeah, first of all, welcome back if you're a first time Pixel Chatter attendee. Uh, you're in for a real treat. We spend about an hour hanging out, and I know it's not for everybody. Some people don't like the longer form shows, uh, but there's always something fun going on. There's always someone in here hanging out, and you get to chat with all the other participants. So it makes it a bit of fun. So if you are brand new here, make sure that you feel comfortable jumping into the chat box. Introduce yourself. Let people know who you are. Feel free to chat away, because uh, that's what it's all about, is uh, being part of the community. Um, if you're a regular, welcome back. Good to have you back. Uh, Ren says it's clod and wet. I think you meant it's cold and wet, Ren. <laughs> clod and wet. Um, now, I just wanted to start off by, uh, first of all, passing my condolences on. I don't know if you heard or not. There was a photographer in Sydney that got swept off the rocks in the big swells the other day. And it just really highlights the importance. And I know I say it in a lot of my videos, if you're going to be shooting seascapes near the sea, please let someone know where you're going and be really careful. Um, get yourself some rock shoes. Grab yourself an EPIRB. Now, if you don't know what an EPIRB is, I've got an EPIRB uh, or a PLB, a personal locator beacon. It's a device that you can put in your pocket, and if you get into trouble, uh, you can activate it, and the emergency services will come looking for you. So my condolences to that family, uh, but it's just a, it's a real warning message to photographers that just because you're not fishermen, uh, you're still at risk. So be very, very careful uh, when you're out shooting by the rocks by the sea. The sea is a very unforgiving beast. Um, all right, let's get stuck into, first of all, what I'd like to do is exciting stuff, really exciting stuff. Let's jump over to my local desktop. There we go. Um, so if you haven't already uh, become a patron, uh, then you may want to. Entirely up to you. There's no, uh, you don't have to. Uh, you still get all this free content without being a patron. But it just shows your support. What we do have, uh, patrons have a private VIP group on Facebook. It's pretty active. Um, there's only about 20 of us in there, but uh, we're a real active bunch sharing photos and things. It looks something like this. I'm pretty sure I've got that page open. Let me have a look. Oh, here it is. 
So as you can see, a real active bunch in here, sharing photos, critiquing, um, talking about gear. So people are asking about what gear they should buy and, you know, just sharing images. And, you know, hopefully you can see that it's a pretty active place to be, a lot of fun. Um, so I want to thank those of you that have come on board as a supporter. Um, as you can see, we're up to 17 patrons, uh, about 10% of our first goal. And uh, I really do appreciate it. I want a, a, bit, a special shout out to uh, Jeff Clark, who's our first webinar junkie patron. So you can become a webinar junkie patron. All the different levels are on the right hand side here. Um, but as a webinar junkie, you get monthly patron only live webinars, which is like an online training. Uh, and then as we record them, you'll get access to all the previously recorded. Now, of course, there's no previously recorded because it's brand new. Uh, but as we build that up, so I know it's a, a bit of a, a leap of faith for for, uh, for Jeff to do that. But I really appreciate the fact that he was our first patron at that level. Um, and what that means is, is that the very first patron-only webinar is going to be on the 30th of August, which is the Wednesday uh, at, I think I said it at 7.30 p.m. Yep, 7.30 p.m. So, and it'll be the last Wednesday of every month, and I'll probably do some extras as well throughout the month um, as the group grows, the webinar junkies grow. And the idea of that is to be able to provide uh, additional training, extra value, new things for you to learn, and uh, just that, if you want that little bit of extra, then you can grab that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a small amount each month to get a bit of extra training, which we know, I think, the trick to being good at anything is to continually be learning. Uh, whether it's you know just getting out there yourself, watching YouTube videos, being a part of a group like this, or any of those things. So thank you very much uh, for everybody who is supporting the channel. It it means the world to me. Uh, you can't um, I can't even put it into words how taken back I am by the support that I got, and so I really appreciate that. So if you do want to join the uh, the Patreon group, you just go to patreon.com slash on three legs with the number three. So that's Patreon dot com slash on three legs with the number three you'll see this page uh, and you'll be able to go through and yeah make your uh make your pledge and become part of the vip group the very important photographers all right another good chance to uh, just give us my facebook page and my instagram page a quick plug if you're not already uh, following those two channels that's where you get a lot of cool stuff um, and what i did was on my trip around the weekend i did my first ever live video facebook live from a shoot as i was doing a sunset shoot and explaining my settings um, and the difference with this to a normal vlog i was vlogging at the same time i was sort of doing it in between vlogging was that uh, viewers could ask questions live about why i was doing what it was i was doing and it was kind of cool it was very interactive so i really enjoyed that i thought that was a bit of fun um, and that went really well so Thank you for uh, those of you that participated in that Facebook Live broadcast, and I'll be doing another one of those. Uh, well, we'll definitely be doing those again when I'm out shooting because I think it worked really, really well. All right, now we have got... Um, I've had a few questions. Uh, oh, before I do get stuck into the questions, something I need to let you all know about is next week's Pixel Chatter is going to be on the Sunday morning. Uh, so I'm going to try a different morning. Hopefully that doesn't affect too many of you, but on the Saturday morning, I'm actually uh, going for a fly in my aeroplane. It has been uh, out of action for about six weeks. And uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm a pilot and I have a share in an aeroplane with a bunch of other guys. And uh, it's been out of action getting some repairs done and it's going away on as one of the guys is taking it on a trip. So I've got to go and do my uh, my recency. In, in aeroplanes, you've got to fly regularly to stay current. So um, Saturday morning was the only time I could do it. So I'm putting the show on to Sunday morning. Um, and maybe what I'll do is a quick live stream from the plane. Who knows? We'll see what happens uh, just for a bit of fun. Uh, so, yeah, next week, Pixel Chat will be on Sunday. Mark your diaries. That way you won't miss out. I will obviously send out the reminders as time goes on. Okay. Now, we're, we're going to um, dive straight into the question section. Before I do that, let's have a look at the chat box and see what's going on. Who we got in there? Wow. Ian says, thanks for... Reviewing my image a few weeks ago. You're welcome. West coast of the South Island. Come shoot with me, Wayne. <laughs> I'd love to, mate. Sounds like an invite. I think I'll be there. Um, I need to get over there. Need to get over there. I'm, I'm going to Perth in a couple of weeks. So I know there's some people in Perth that won't, may want to catch up with me. Um, and then uh, I'm going to try and get to New Zealand early next year. That's my plan. Uh, let's have a look here. Gwen. G'day, Gwen. Good to see you in here. Christian from Sweden, hello. Uh, Chance says, I'll take your cold and wet if you take my dry and hot. I'm in Arizona. That's for you, Barracuda. Nathan, 
<laughs> it's been pretty hot over there in the USI here. I've had a bit of a heat wave this week. Uh, recently subscribed Will from Rainswept Glasgow, Scotland. Hey, g'day Will, and thank you for subscribing. Really appreciate it. Cy Wheeler from Portsmouth, England. G'day, g'day, g'day. Dave from King Cumber, g'day mate. All right, good stuff. All right, let's get stuck straight into this question section. Um, as you can see, I'm just enjoying my coffee from that uh, uh, the bloody good event that the uh, the biggest morning tea put on for the Cancer Council. I'll just finish that off. All right, so a question that I get a lot is about cleaning uh, camera sensor. And I think a lot of people get quite nervous about cleaning their sensor. And if you were to send it off, is anybody just in the chat box, has anybody sent their camera off to have the sensor cleaned? And if you did, can you tell me how much they charged you? I'm just interested to know, because I haven't done it for a long time. I do it myself. I'm going to show you how I do it. I've got five, five different methods that I use, and uh, I'm going to show you all five different methods and in what order I do them. So if you have had your camera sensor cleaned by Nikon, Canon, Fuji, or whoever, can you just whack it in the chat box and let me know how much they charged you? I'd be interested to know. Not seeing many people have done that. Okay, looks like most people haven't done that. Okay, in the chat box, have you ever noticed that you've got dust spots on your sensor? Just whack that in the chat box. Have you ever noticed you've got dust spots on your sensor? So you take a photo, you stick it into Lightroom, and uh, and you see that you've got dust spots. Let me know if that's happened to you. Be interested to know. Interested to know. Okay, Chance says yes. Oh, Brian says he's had his cleaned. It was eighty dollars. Okay, cool. The chat box seems to have a little bit of a, uh, a delay on it for me. So, <laughs> yes, had dust spots. Says Susan. Okay. Tim says of course. Sure have. Says Anthony. Gwen, yes. Brian, all the time. Ren says cleaned it myself. Good on you, Ren. Nathan says yeah. Okay. So one of the questions I get a lot is how to deal with those. Now there's two things that you can do. One is you can just put up with it and you can clean them off later on in um, you know, uh, Lightroom or Photoshop using the spot removal tool. And, and even if you clean your sensors, at some point you're going to get dust spots or dust, dust bunnies as Wayne's just called them there, uh, are a fact of digital life. It is true. Um, but what you can do is you can really reduce the amount of dust bunnies that you get by keeping your sensor clean. Um, and prevention, of course, is the best call, is the best thing to do rather than treating the, uh, the the symptoms themselves. Prevention of the symptoms means being careful when you take your lens off. Um, when you swap lenses on your camera, keep your camera body facing down uh, because dust tends to settle down, not go up. Uh, it depends on how windy it is, which is you know another tip is don't go changing your lenses when it's windy. Uh, it's just about being careful and mindful when you are changing your lenses about the dust that is around. Now I've seen people actually change their lenses uh, inside a coat or their inside a bag or something. It's actually really silly, and the reason for that is because there's a lot of dust, uh, fiber dust from coats and clothing that you don't see, and it ends up being stuck on your sensor. Now your sensor uh, has a lot of static in it, so it actually is a, like a magnet to all the dust, and that's why the dust gets caught in there. So um, you know there's things that you can do. To prevent it but then if you have it, it's not pre completely preventable 100 so you need a way to get clean it off and i used to send mine off to get cleaned um, and it wasn't so much the cost that bothered me i don't think i think it was about 100 bucks 120 dollars uh australian maybe 150 uh the thing that was more frustrating was the time it took so you'd send it off you'd have to wait for it to come back and of course the inconvenience so i started looking to, into how easy was it to clean my own sensor? And so I thought I'll share that with you today because a lot of people ask me about dust bunnies and about cleaning their sensors. And I have five things that I do uh, to keep my to clean my sensor. I'm going to show you the five tools or things that I use. Um, all right. So the first thing is this here. Let me just see. Make sure you can see that. Okay. There we go. And you've probably seen one of these before. Okay, they call it a rocket. This is made by Gitos, which is G-I-O-T-T-O-S. And as you, you know, press the uh, the rocket like that, it sprays air out here. And you know, that should clear dust off of your sensor. So typically what I do is I put the camera up that way, I blow the air into the camera, and hopefully the dust will drop out. Okay, now if you've got a mirrorless, nothing to do, you just go straight away and blow it in it. If you've got a normal DSLR, 
you want to put the mirror into lockup because the dust is not on the mirror. It doesn't matter if it's on the mirror. Um, and that's why typically if you see a spot when you look through the, uh, the viewfinder, it's usually not a big deal because quite often it's just on one of the mirrors that's putting the picture into your image. Uh, otherwise, it could be on your lens. It's not on your sensor. Okay, so if you see a spot through looking through the viewfinder, it's not on your sensor. It's on your lens or it's on your mirror. Uh, if it's on your photos, then of course it's on your sensor. So that's that's port of call number one. Really portable, easy to chuck into the camera bag and easy to use. Doesn't require any batteries or anything. Just a little bit of hand muscle, and uh, and you can clean your. So who's got one of those? Anybody got one of those? I'm sure most of you would have one of those. Uh, if not, you can grab yourself one. Now, if you're you know, finding that you've got stubborn dust and that's not removing the dust, you can then go to this beast here. Yep, I can see lots of years coming through for that. Excellent. So this here is called Dust Buster and you'll get different brands. Um, as you can see, this one cost me 15 bucks for a can of air. Can you believe it? <laughs> it's like water and air. And they work out how to resell them. They certainly know how to price them. Now, I got this from my local electronics store here in Australia called J-Car Electronics. Um, you probably get it from any sort of electronics enthusiast store. But essentially, all it is is compressed air. You press the trigger here, and it blows compressed air out. Much faster than what I can get this to work. Okay, and so I use this to keep my lenses clean and my sensor clean as well, my camera clean. It's a great thing uh, to use. You've just got to be careful because if you turn it on an angle or upside down, it'll actually send out frozen crystallized particles, which will damage your sensor. So when you use this for the first time, I suggest you just play around with it on, um, you know, not on your hand because you don't want to freeze your hand either. But just try it on something that is not going to matter, like get an old chopping board or something, and just experiment and see what angle you start to get the crystallized, the frozen crystallized uh, particles coming out. So you can sort of just learn how it works because you don't want those particles going into your camera sensor. Uh, and I find that works really well. Uh, so that's my that's my second uh, thing that I use. So I use this first. Have you noticed the first these first two things I use don't touch the sensor, okay? So I use the, the rocket first, I then use the compressed air next. Uh, it works really, really well. All right, and then we start to move into other methods. And so the next thing that I have is in this little kit here. I don't know if you can see this. Um, now this is made by a company called Visible Dust. Uh, and it's called... What's it called? I can't remember what it's called. It is called a something angel or something. I can't remember now. Oh, there we go. An Arctic butterfly. It's on the case. <laughs> it's called an Arctic butterfly. Now, you're wondering what it looks like. It looks a bit like a pen. But what it actually is, if I take that off, is a, is a brush that rotates like that. I you can see that. Yep. And that gives it an electronic charge. And then when you go... You flip the switch the other way, you can see that light has come on. Okay, and then you go inside your, your, your camera and you run the brush along the sensor and the electronic charge in the sensor picks up the dust particles. And it works really well. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite things to use. And uh, you just gotta watch that you don't hit the edges of your sensor where there's sometimes a little bit of oil inside your camera. Uh, it's probably just from you know, something to do with the, the shutter mechanism. So you just wanna make sure that you're not dragging oil across your sensor. but Works really, really well. Uh, it's called an Arctic Butterfly. And uh, I can't even remember where I bought it from, but works really well. I can see Tim says he has one well. Great, great cleaning tool and very noisy. Oh, it's just come out of its little keeper there. But a uh, great tool. Works really well. There you go, you can have that first hand noise right there. Um, you just gotta be careful to keep it in, in, packed away neatly so the brush doesn't get destroyed. And I always find that it's difficult to turn off and make sure it's off completely. So I like to pull the batteries out of it in between use. Uh, considering I don't use it very often either because typically the other one goes. Um, Nathan's asking how much. I can't remember. I've had it for that long. But I think it was somewhere around the $100 mark. So it wasn't super expensive. All right. Um, solution number four. Hopefully I'm not overwhelming you here. Um, it looks like a first aid kit. Here we go. Let me show you what this is. Now, I don't know if you can actually read what that says. Put it in, there we go, you can, yep. 
Dust Aid. Okay, so this is made by a company called Dust Aid. And this is called Dry Sensor Cleaning. And what it is, let me show you. But you have these little sticky strips okay, that it comes with, and this funny little stamp. And you put a sticky strip onto the end of your stamp, and then you just use this, and you stamp it inside your camera on the sensor. And it's probably one of the easiest ways to remove dust. And I typically find this does a really good job. If the other methods don't work, um, this usually fixes it. I don't usually get to method number five very often. Uh, I find this works extremely well, and it's made by a company called Dust Aid. The Dust Aid have a website, which I will show you. Um, I can't remember where I bought them from. I think it was from the UK. Maybe this company's in the UK. I'm not sure, uh, but it was a, a bit of, you know, it took a bit of work and hunting down to get them. Uh, but this company, Dust Aid, is uh, is a small company somewhere that makes this stuff, uh, but it works really, really well. So you can see that picture there. Uh, is the the dry solution now it's just gone to the wet solution um, the dry one will come back up again but you see the dry sensor cleaning here is here down on the left hand side and you know I find that works really really well uh, if all else fails so if blowing dust out doesn't work stamping it out always typically works um, and they give you these little you know really good cases which just make sure that it's easy for you to carry around but also keeps the dust out of it so that's solution number four now let's go on to solution number five. Yes, George, that was the Arctic butterfly. I'm not sure how much they are. All right, um, the next one is another Dust Aid product. By the way, this is not sponsored by anybody. Uh, I'm not paid to tell you this stuff. This is just me helping you. Um, dust wand kit. Now this is the one that most people get nervous about because you've got to put some wet stuff inside your camera. Um, but actually works really well and it's really easy to do. Uh, now before I bought the kit, I actually had used um, a, a cheaper sort of solution, which was this here. I just bought these things called PEX pads here, which is basically what it is. And a little tiny spatula thing. And what you do, I'll show you exactly what you do, it's easy. You grab a pad, you then put it like so over your sensor swipe, so you've got the very end of it. I then grab some masking tape, like so, just a little bit, you don't need much. And I just tape that on, like so. Um, and if you can see the picture, on this website of the dust aid guy doing it let me quick see if that if you get that no it's just changed on me let me see which one it is it is not that one it's that one there um, as you can see you basically put it inside your camera and you swipe it across the sensor now before you do that you need to put some solution on it so you need to get yourself some solution uh, and this one here has it in the kit. I have another bottle of it. Uh, this is the Dust Aid Ultra Clean. But I think um, you can sort of get different stuff from different places. So you put one or two drops of that onto the end of this swab and then you just run it across your sensor once one way, you then flip it over, you do it the next way and then you change, I like to change the, where the, the tip of the swab is. So you don't put a whole new pad on, you just undo the tape move it around slightly so you get a clean clean part of the pec pad pex pad and then all of a sudden you've got a, a nice clean part that you're now using and so if if everything else fails that tends to work really well so if you've got dust bunnies and it's frustrating you then that's a good way for you to get rid of them um, so that's my five <laughs> that's my five ways let's just i'll just quickly google arctic butterflies see if i can find where that is available for you arctic butterfly let's have a look yep visible dust so it looks like Amazon BH photo BH photos definitely got them let's just quickly show you that screen so let's have a look where is it I'm sure I just saw them they said they had it there it is so it's made by a company called visible dust as you can see there it's 140 Australian dollars um, so it's gone up a lot since I bought it, uh, but it works really, really well. And when I've typed that in, you can see there's a heap of cleaning solutions have come up. 
Um, so I always just say, be confident. Don't. I, I don't think you can damage your sensor very easily. Uh, so if you feel like, we'll just go back and see if I can find the company, Invisible Dust here. You can actually look at their, their site. Doesn't look like it, does it? Visible dust. There it is. So you can see how easy it is to find them. Just use Google. There it is there, the Arctic Butterfly sensor brush. That one's got two lights on it, the one that's in that example. But uh, go and check it out because it works really well. Like I said, I'm not paid to endorse that at all. I just, it was a question that I got asked a lot was about cleaning sensors. So I thought I would just show you exactly how I go about cleaning my sensor. Uh, and hopefully that gives you the confidence to go about cleaning yours because I know it can be frustrating when you've got dust. Alrighty. Let's go over to the chat quickly before we do the critiques. Um, today I've got Tim Millington's, Rob Roy's and Nathan Pollock's images we're going to critique. So we'll get to those very, very shortly. Before we do that, let's jump into the chat box and just see who's there. Uh, George says expensive, yes, yes, but it works well. Um, and once you buy it, I've had that for about, I reckon I've had that for a good eight years or so, and it still works fine. So, you know, it's a, a good, good way to do it. Um, 94 Rengar says, an alternative to canned air is Hurricane handless air system. Doesn't use chemicals and the charge usually lasts about three to four months. Okay, cool. Good to know. Baz says, Hi Ben, I'm a hobby photographer from the Netherlands. I've recently subscribed to your channel and this is my first time watching your live stream. Cheers, Baz. Welcome, mate. Welcome. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. Oh, you said you have. That's sorry. <laughs> I missed that. Um, Nikki, 114 pounds. Yeah, it is expensive, isn't it? But it works. That's why I say that's... Realistically, if you, if you got yourself... I reckon the stamp kit from Dust Aid, which is like, you know, I, th I don't think that would be expensive. I can't remember how much I paid for it. That works really well, and maybe that's what you should do. Uh, Brian says, I ordered stuff from BH on Tuesday and got it yesterday, three days from New York to Geelong. Pretty important, isn't it? <laughs> pretty impressive, rather. Not important, pretty impressive. All right. Yeah, the Euro is expensive. The, sorry, the, um, the Dust, the Butterfly is expensive, yes. So... Cool picks photography. Sensor vacuum sucks all the dust out. Sensor vacuum. So it's obviously something else that I don't use. But anyway, that's my five ways. So it sort of gives you an idea of the things that I do. Typically, um, I only need to use the compressed air. I very rarely have to touch the sensor. But if I do want to give the sensor a good clean, and inevitably, eventually, I'm going to need to, that's what I do, uh, is I just use those tools. All right. So let's jump into Lightroom. And have a look at this week's images for critique. I've got three images. Uh, the first one that you can see on the left there, the square image, is from Rob Roy uh, of a bridge somewhere. Um, the second one there is from Tim Millington, and it's of my most favourite beach in the entire planet, uh, which is Turrometa Beach. Now, if you're from Sydney, it's on the northern beaches at Wood. It's called Turrometa, T-U-R-I-M-E-T-T-A. Um, and it has some green moss that grows in the winter that makes it really photogenic. Um, and then the next one on the right is by uh, Barracuda, Nathan Pollock, who's also in the chat box as well. And uh, we're going to critique all three of these images. So let's start off by having a look at... Uh, we'll just go into this one here, which is Rob Roy's. We'll just get rid of this bottom screen so we can make it as big as possible. Now, I don't know if you can see how pixelated that is, so I only have a very small um, file, unfortunately. Let me just go to one to one. Yeah, extremely small file to work with. Um, so I won't be able to do a lot of critiquing on this because it's an extremely small. I didn't realize how small it was until I just put it up in Lightroom here. But at one to one, it's very small. Make sure when you send me your images for critique that you try and make it, I don't know, sort of at least 1200 on the longest edge, up to sort of 2000. Um, and it's easy to send photos around these days. Uh, but let's just have a look. I'll zoom in a little bit. And that way we can have a look at what's going on. I'll just zoom it out just a tad. Oh, crikey. Let's just zoom it out 
a little bit so we're not going so big there we go that's probably better so that's four times the original size so this is a photo that he, rob took at Latour, latourel falls or bridge using a 24 to 85 millimeter lens on a nikon nikon d500 um doesn't give me a lot i've got no exif information so i can't tell you much about it all i wanted to talk about was probably in this image here was uh making sure you've got your composition so it's a bit more appealing i can see what you're trying to do with the leading lines and that works relatively well but the crop the square crop doesn't work i think because we lose too much of the image and what happens is i feel as a photographer is we can we can frustrate whoever's viewing the image uh, by not including enough um, it's good to have curiosity and invoke a bit of curiosity but really we want to have a, a, you know a little bit more image here so i would have gone a bit wider got a bit more of the bridge in a bit more to whatever was to the left of the bridge and you, you would have got a better shot now it's very difficult for me to critique because at uh <laughs> At, at 100 percent it's so small i can't see it um so that's probably the only feedback i can give you on that one rob if you want to send me another one in, in for critique um just make sure it's a bit larger and that way i can make sure i give you some better critiquing all right let's jump into image number two so image number two is by uh, tim millington from sydney of turameta beach and if you read let me read the notes he sent me he said here's an image i took at dusk at turameta he said i didn't have the high-res file with me it was taken at about f8 25 seconds iso 200 a polarizer and a three-stop nd and what you can see is not the sun rising but the moon um so it's uh it's uh a, an interesting image i love the moon and the reflection of the moon along the water i think that works really well um, a couple of things that I, I, I think work really well in this image one is the leading line from the corner of this rock but um, i feel that it would have been nice to see the edge of the rock um, the rock is just going to finish here so it could have been that little bit wider um, but that's been critical besides that it's it's pretty good looks good and i love the way um, that it's composed i love the way that the if you look at the the composition you've got this line on the top left hand corner where the cliff comes down and then you've got this line from the bottom right hand corner where it comes up and it sort of creates a line through the entire image that leads the eye so that's my dogs going off because someone's walking by <laughs> and then you can see as you come up this rock or down that rock you hit the yeah my dogs unfortunately they'll stop soon they're just howling because someone another dog went past <laughs> but you can see as you come up or down the rock your eye hits then the moonshine which sort of then drags your eye up to the moon i think it would have been nice if the moon was slightly lower in the picture um, and with moon it's interesting or sun things can move really really quickly and so you need to be prepared for that for the fact that the sun or the moon will rise or drop really really quickly and as a result of that you'll end up um you know if you're not quick enough you'll end up missing it now this is a um, 25 second exposure i think it could have been done a bit quicker i'm not sure why uh, you use the polarizer tim because you probably didn't need to um at all the three stop nd filter because um you probably could have done without either and still got a decent length exposure that would have worked still got some water movement because i would say that 25 seconds when water's moving really quickly um 25 seconds can sometimes be too long right or you can have a too long an exposure it depends what you're after um, this really um, misty look of the water is a result of a long exposure of water moving a lot um, so it can work but i always say experiment a bit and try and get a you know half a second or one second or even you know maybe a maximum two second and you'll see that you'll actually capture the water movement so instead of it being a mist you'll get the movement and the movement will create that energy and that emotion in your image um, so i think that's pretty good i think the only other thing is i think um, it's got a bit of a color cast and i'm not sure exactly what that is if i just jump into the develop and just quickly change it slightly you can see that by just removing that color cast 
uh, it has sort of changed the feeling of the image. So it was very cold. So if you think about your white balance when you're taking photos, it looked to me like it was slightly too cool. Now, once again, my screen is calibrated. I calibrate my screen using a Spider Express. I think, no, sorry, a Spider 4. Um, and that means that, uh, you know, my colors on my screen are exact. Uh, and, and this is a, a real challenge for people is if you've got your screen not calibrated, sometimes you can miss that. Uh, but I can see just when that's at, when that temperature was at zero, I can see it's way too blue. I don't know what you can see, but you probably be able to see that. Um, and the sand just doesn't look a natural color. So straight away it tells me I've just got to lift that up a bit. And doing things like that will just make a huge difference um, to your images. The other thing I would probably do to this, and I'll just use one of my presets for this, is I'm going to use uh, a top and bottom gradient, maybe too strong. Yep. So I've just used a very minor top and bottom gradient. And what that does is I'll just go back into my gradients and just change the the temperature of them slightly. What it does is just gives us a bit of a a gradient on the top and the bottom to draw our eyes into the image a little bit more. So sometimes little tricks like that can really there we go, we just turn that off so you can see. So little tricks like that can really just make your image a bit more unique. Same with vignetting, you know. I'll do a bit of vignetting so you can see the impact that it can have on an image. So never be afraid to to put, that's just very mild, and then this is a, a much um, darker vignette. And this is just my presets, which I'm going to throw into the VIP group, by the way, at some point. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just going through renaming them. So, you know, you can sort of see that I've got all sorts of different presets in here that do different things. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that gives you a bit of an idea as to what is possible um, just when you when you start to play around with images. And I've gone, I've, I've now ruined his image with my presets there. That's okay. We're going to move on to the next one. Um, so good job, Tim. I think that um, you know just be really careful with your white balance. Maybe. Uh, move back just that slight bit, maybe a, 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 a faster shutter speed so you capture a little bit more of the water movement um, would have probably been good. I'd say you're probably at your ISO base, which is good. Uh, and, you know, just decide, do I really need a polarizer on or not? Maybe you did here because the moon was reflecting off of things. I'm not sure. Uh, but typically polarizers don't work well when you're pointing your camera directly into the reflection source, whether it's the sun or the moon. So um, I would question whether you needed to bother. Uh, probably just made your um, camera need a, sh a slower shutter speed. So there you go. Let's jump into the next one. And the next one is from Barracuda, who's in the chat box. Nathan is in there somewhere. And Nathan gave me a bit of a story with this one, which I'll just expand my right bar out so I can read through his notes. So we said, got the attached image today using the Nikon D7200 and the 17 to 55 2.8 lens. Hey, good lens. Uh, used a 10 stop screw in ND. Was it 17 to 55 or 35 millimeter? Was there a 17 to 55 2.8? Yeah, I didn't know there was. There you go. They've got so many, they got 110 lenses or something. You got uh, used a 10 stop screw in ND and polarizing filter. And I'd say you probably needed both in this circumstance. In fact, using a polarizing filter when you're shooting um, a scene like this is, is actually a really smart thing to do. And I'll talk about why in a second. Um, this is was wondering what your thoughts are. I was a bit constrained in the uh, yeah, so 17 to 55 DX F28. Thanks, Barracuda. I was a bit constrained in composition as I was already perched on the side of a large rock. I would have had love to move to the left. Unfortunately, there is a concrete lookout there, and you can see the shadow at the bottom left hand corner. Okay, um, use the spot healing tool to clean it up. I've tried to use the big rock as a focal point. Okay, cool. Uh, which leads through the image up to the top of the falls. I couldn't go any higher due to people traffic. Excellent. I focus on the bottom in the middle of the shot using live view. Sun was popping in and out of clouds. Yeah. Okay, so I think let's have a bit of a look. Um, and this is a really good file size too. So um, what size has he sent me here? Okay, so 4,000 by 6,000. So there you go. Don't be afraid to send me images of 4,000 by 6,000 because it works. Um, I think, and I've got the EXIF information here, so 
135 seconds at f11, ISO 100 at 35 millimeters. Uh, yeah, 17 to 55 f28. There we go. That's the lens down there. Yeah, I don't shoot DX, so typically don't um, don't know these lenses. So the first thing I can say to you, Nathan, is brilliant job with the exposure. Uh, you've nailed the exposure. With waterfalls, it can be really tricky. Uh, the sun was definitely behind a cloud when you did it, which is what you want, because the sun will then, if, if the sun was out, it would really damage the highlights in this image. Um, I would have said that um, I would have tried some without the big stopper on, and I don't know if you did or not, because 135 seconds is a very long exposure for a waterfall. You probably don't need to do that. And you could have shortened that if you brought your f-stop down a bit. You could have come down to, you know, something like f5.6, and you still would have been okay because of the the uh, the distance between the boulder and the back of the waterfall. I think you would have been okay with depth of field. You might have had to get f7.1 or 8, but you certainly didn't need f11. Uh, in this example here. Um, ISO 100 is a good thing to do. Obviously you base ISO on that camera. And um, so from a technical aspect, uh, it, sometimes it's it's tempting to use the big stopper where maybe we don't need to. And you could have gone with something, you probably could have got a two or three second exposure out of your camera without using the big stopper. And I don't know if you did or not, but uh, would have been... Um, interesting to see those shots now as for composition i can see why you did what you did if you had people up the top here um, but i would have liked to have seen a bit more at the top you probably knew i was going to say that <laughs> and uh, uh you know if you're making the boulder here the feature then it's just make you got to make sure it's on an intersection so if i just quickly go into the let's go into the develop module and i'm going to put the rule of thirds over the top and you'll see that boulder is not really sitting on any of the intersections so I can straight away give this more impact, and I do love the fact that you want the boulder to be the hero here, just by giving it a crop. Um, and all of a sudden, by cropping it, it's gonna have more impact. So if I just undo that so you can see again. Um, you know, there, there's no, I don't really feel like there is any focus. I think it's just, it, it's a good shot of a waterfall. I love the trees and stuff, but if you really want to make the eye draw into something, you've got to think about that composition. And in, let's, in fact, I'm going to do it the other way. I'm going to bring the, the boulder onto this rule of thirds cross here, and I'm going to actually just bring that up slightly. Okay, now the eye, the water is now leading through the shot. Now with a waterfall, it's actually a good thing to do is if you've got the water coming from the right-hand side and have it exiting from the left-hand side, that can work well as, as well. Um, let's just... Bring this down a bit and make it a bit more of a vertical pattern. Problem that tree, they want it, don't want that foliage in there. There we go, something like that. Um, so that looks really good. So it's just a matter of playing around sometimes. And I think that it's tempting. Um, let's see if we can just... We don't always need all of the, uh, the waterfall in either because of all those people in the way. You know, you could have something like that even where the water's now coming in from the right dropping off this little waterfall from the left and then going out to the, the, the left end of the shot again, coming from the right to the left. Um, and just little things like just your cropping can make a big difference. So it's easy to go, yep, there's a lot of people around, which makes it difficult. Um, but, you, you know, sometimes it's about getting really creative. And you can see, if you look at that crop compared to the original, um, the original crop, which it's not going to let me do because I need to duplicate the image. Let me go back. Where is the original? Let me just hit the crop tool. You know, when you go really wide, if that rock was your hero in this image, at that crop there, the rock isn't your hero. It's just, um, it's not the focus. So for me, it's all about composition. Composition is probably the key. People always go, oh, what camera should I get? What lens should I use? What tripod should I have? What? I no, no, I always say first, learn how to compose your shots in a way that really draws the viewer's eyes and tells a story. Um, and whilst there's nothing wrong with it, like it's a good shot, right? Perfectly exposed. But I think from a composition point, I would have said, let's let's really just think about how we can drag the viewer right into the image. And even, you know, doing something like a square crop like that. But even that, that doesn't quite work because that rocks too much in the middle. So something like that. 
you know, it just drags the eyes in. Now, one of the challenges with the longer exposure is you have lost a lot of detail in the waterfall. And um, so I would have shot something at a, a shorter exposure, uh, which would have give you a bit more detail. The other thing you could do if you wanted to is that trick I've shown you before where you grab a brush, grab a brush, make sure everything's at zero before you start brushing, otherwise you'll, you'll really do your head in. Bring your exposure down to minus four. And then I'll just zoom in at one to one. I'll just go to four to one. And I'll show you a little trick that works really well. We'll do it on this bit of the falls here. Is you just grab your, your brush, make sure it's not too big. What have I got here? There we go. Brush size, there we go. And you just, you know, you just come into this. And what you want to do is we want to bring some detail back in here. So my brush size is a bit small. And you want to make sure that on your brush, you've got a bit of a feather going on. Maybe that flow up, bring the density down a bit. You just adjust things and you just start to bring in some of the detail, bring it back in by brushing over the waterfall. You can see how those dark lines, I'm starting to bring them back in. And that, that is the detail that it's missing. I'm doing this really roughly, by the way, so don't, don't take my exact example here. I would do this, typically I would do this in Photoshop if, if I was doing it, and I would use layers for different parts of the image so I could really get in. But you can put the lines back in, and then when you go back out to one-to-one, -to -one that, and then you, I know it looks terrible right now, but when you reduce the exposure on it, back to, it starts to blend back in just a little bit. So just we just want a little bit in there, just a little bit. Let me get it to where it looks decent. Somewhere about there. Now you'll see that what's what's happened now, just in that part of the waterfall, I've brought some lines back in and it starts to bring the detail back into the image. Um, and that way, even if you've lost the detail, you can sort of bring it in. And you've got to be a lot more careful than what I was. Um, you know, if we, we we jump in at the top here, if I, let me go, I'll, I'll zoom right in up here at four to one. Let me show you, just, it's a trick I learned a long time ago and it works really well. Let's just grab the brush again. I'll try and be more careful. <laughs> Let's see if I can be more careful. And you'll see when you do it, you get these lines. See these lines coming in? And so if you ever lose the detail, you can just put them back in. You know? And I know, I know that right now it looks a bit funny because I've got, remember I've got it at minus four, my exposure. We're not going to keep it at minus four. We're going to fix it up later. So if you can just follow the lines in the image, so it, it works really well. As you can see, I'm, I'm still doing it quick and rough because I know you guys don't want to watch me working on a photo for hours. Um, and I do. I probably put way too much time into my photos sometimes. Sometimes I do them really fast. Other times I'll spend way too much time <laughs> doing this type of thing. All right. So I've done a fair few there. Let's just zoom out so you can see what it looks like. See, the lines look really ugly. But when I then reduce the exposure, I just keep reducing it until they sort of complement the details. So you can see my exposure is like minus 0.67 and it's just brought back some detail into that area of the image that wasn't there before. Um, and it's a good trick to do because what happens is when you do long exposures, you'll lose a lot of that detail. Uh, it's also a good trick on things like even rocks, you know, you can use it on rocks. Let me show you. We'll do it on this rock. Uh, actually, I'll just zoom that out. A little bit let's just go to two to one and same thing um, grab your brush minus four exposure and anywhere you want to really accentuate the the shadows in a rock or the points to really make it more three-dimensional you sort of grab your, uh, your your brush and you just brush over anywhere where you want the shadows to really stand out and what happens is you end up with something just look it comes to life. So I'm just showing some really cool tricks here that I've learned a long time ago. A lot of photographers won't tell you these little tricks. They like to hide them, keep them to yourselves. I don't mind sharing them. Um, and it just can make a huge difference to your picture if you just focus on using it because it's it, sometimes we lose a little bit of this in our images if we're not careful, you know. So it's good just to be able to add a bit back in. You can see I'm just sort of doing that really roughly, but if I now zoom back out, 
if the rock was your uh was your hero you really want it to have that extra bit of pump about it so you can see now that the rock is starting to look really vibrant and then what i'd probably do is i'd grab another brush let's do this let's grab another brush let's reset everything else to zero hey ralph boy good to see you here thanks uh, sam allen for, like the tips put your clarity up to 100 percent grab your brush am i on brush size oh, brush size there we go by the way, I use a Wacom tablet, if you're wondering what I'm using. And then brush a whole heap of clarity over the rock. There we go. A whole heap of clarity over the rock. And then if you've got something like this, where I've cropped this, and I've deliberately done, this is like a, it's like a Z. So if you think the water's coming in from the right, just, you know, really, we want the water to stand out. We want this rock to really stand out. So just, you know, go crazy brushing in the clarity over that rock there we go okay let me get rid of that brush now you sort of sort of starting to see well how this is coming to life now um as i'm working on now my next thing i would say is i would like a little bit more vibrance in the foliage um so let's grab another brush this time i'm going to bring the clarity down to zero for now i'm going to put the saturation all the way up um, will I do it that way? Well, yeah, let's do it this way. There's a couple of ways you can do this, but I'm just going to do this. This is the quickest way. Let's get the brush, and I'm just going to go over the where the foliage is. I really want it to stand out. So I want the greens to pop more. So I'm just brushing in saturation over the foliage. Um, and if you if you did saturation over the whole image, what happens is the um, unfortunately the colors in the water would go funny okay so now what we can do is we can also um what should i do will i do that let's i'm going to lift the exposure just slightly in those areas and i'm going to give it a heap of clarity as well and then I'm going to increase the contrast in those trees. Um, that's looking good. All right. So let's go to the before and after, just so you can start to see the differences between the two. So, um, you know, there's subtle changes, but they're changes that make a big difference, especially if your rock is the hero. Have a look at the difference between the two rocks in particular. Just where I went through and I enhanced the shadows. Uh, you can really see the difference in the two images. Uh, and it makes a huge difference, an absolutely huge difference. Um, so it's important that you, you you know try different things. Don't be afraid to try things. Um, what else could I do to this? Uh, you know, we could do the overall vibrance. But once again, ooh, I'd be careful with that. Let's do another brush. Um, you know, the other thing that can work well sometimes which you wouldn't expect is dehaze. Uh, let me just put dehaze up for a second. And dehaze has this. Typically, I think dehaze is for skies, but um, I found it works well on water. So all I'm doing, by the way, here is I'm brushing in dehaze over the waterfall. I like the look of that. That, that has really brought it out. And I'm going to add some more clarity then to the waterfall, there we go. So you can really start to see the waterfall now that we're bringing the details back out now, if you have a look, which is cool. Uh, and then I'd probably, I'm just gonna get another brush. Oop, I didn't mean to do that, brush first. And I'm gonna bring the temp down. I'm gonna get rid of the dehaze. And I'm just gonna go over these spots that are a bit brown. And I know that you all know I don't, like it to look too brown i like to try and clean my water up just a bit who wants dirty water just changes it a little bit not a lot um there we go computer's struggling okay let's wait for the computer to catch up it's uh there we go it's done all right, so there you go. Um, you know, hopefully you can see the difference that we've made there. And whilst they're all little tiny changes, I think um, 
you know, with photography, when you're processing an image, sometimes it is about lots of little changes to make one big change. And, you know, you have the power. Everyone, I mean, Lightroom's so easy to use. And, you know, I could probably spend hours on this image just continually going through finding little things to fix up because it's just the way I am. Um, but I think you did a great job, Nathan. The photo itself is a good photo. I would have shortened the shutter speed slightly. Um, I would have thought a little bit more about my composition. You, ex you, you nailed your exposure, which is a hard thing to do with a with a 10-stop filter on. Um, but you absolutely, absolutely nailed the exposure. If you have a look at the histogram up here, um, you can see that there's it's just perfectly exposed. So well done on that, mate. And uh, I think you've done a good job. I think overall, I, I think you should be proud of that photo. And hopefully that's helped you. Just for me, it is about uh, composition and getting that composition right uh, is what I think is important. All right. I think I need to get a light. I'm very dark, aren't I? <laughs> All right. Hopefully you found that helpful. Um, Nathan all right there we go does that light me up a bit I think so let's jump into live chat what do we got Gwen likes that that's good great tip with saturation you can also use it to make the water more white yes you can because then you can drag the saturation out which is a good tip it's about the little changes g'day Aussie Paul good to see you here mate The Barracuda says you'll go and have another play with it. Yeah, look, there's no right or wrong, by the way. As I critique these images, I always feel, uh, I always worry that um, <laughs> I'm going to upset somebody, and it's never about that. It's always about you, me um, just showing, uh, you know, the things that I would do, and hopefully that adds value and it helps you. Um you know, I do, I always worry that I'm going to upset somebody but because the thing about photography, and I'm a big believer of this, is there's no right or wrong. If you like it, it's a great photo. Um, there are some rules that I think, you know, things like composition that I think are really important. Uh, but, you know, what if, if you took the photo and you really like it, then good. But if you look at the photo and you go, uh, I think there's something not quite right about it, well then, you know, ask other people to say, what do they think? What could they do better? Um, I always like looking too when I go to shoot a location at what other people have done from a composition point of view because um, for two reasons I like to get something different but I also learn a lot from other photographers and the way they've shot a certain subject um, and probably my most famously shared image is the well, I've got a couple one's the Aurora and that's for a definite reason but one's of the Australian of, of the Sydney Harbour Bridge and um, and it's because I think I shot it differently, right, to what everybody else ever did. And from a composition point of view, I think that's the key, is try and find something that really works, draws the viewer's eye in and uh, from a composition point. And then just technically, as you process your image, just look at it. And, and sometimes I find I'll do a bit of processing and then I'll go away and then I'll come back and I'll have another look and, and I'll make some more tweaks or changes. Uh, so it's, a, it's an evolution, you know, it's never a set thing. And it's easy to get hung up on what camera you have, what lenses you have, what tripod you have, what camera bag you have, but none of that matters. Um, I could use this. And I was actually thinking about, and this is my vlogging camera, by the way. Um, this is what I use for vlogging. That's the little fluffy mic shield, so it stops the wind blowing in the mic. But I use that for vlogging. It's a Canon G7X Mark II, but I've used that for photography. I could use that and get some amazing shots. It's just... Um, it's not about having a big DSLR. It's not about having um, the latest tripod or the latest bag. It's about getting out there and you know thinking about your uh, your composition as you take each shot. Really getting that craft right. All right. So let's do a last check in the chat box. We'll wrap the show up. Um, thank you to Tim, Rob, and Nathan for sending those in. I really do appreciate it. If you do have a photo that you want critiqued on Pixel Chatters. Uh, send it through to me. Down below is the email address, ben at on3legs.com. Send it through and I will get it on a future show. I've still got uh, a lot of images, but I'd love you to keep sending them through. Um, I don't have many images from women, so <laughs> I know there's a couple in the chat box. Send your images through and uh, I'd love to critique those for you. Seems like the blokes want their uh, images critiqued more than the girls. <laughs> Maybe we should make it a competition. <laughs> Um, so let's go over to the chat box. Brian says, there's the last time I'll be watching. What? 
Oh, hang on, I'll keep reading that. On this computer, as my hard drive is corrupted, uh, i got a new computer to set up. Chance says, thank you for the chatter. I learned a lot today. You're welcome, Chance. My absolute pleasure, my friend. Ah, Gwen's going to get an image in. Awesome. Fantastic. Gwen's going to get an image in. All right. Now, uh, just a couple of quick things. Uh, reminder, if you're not already, you can join the Patreon group and get into the VIPs. I'll just once again show you what that looks like so you know where to go. Um, so go to patreon.com slash on three legs. Thank you to all of those that are already patrons. There's quite a few of you in the live chat. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you are on Facebook, you can also jump into the VIP community and you know come and join us in here where we're sharing images and chatting about gear and you know we can get critiques happening in here almost instantly, which is cool. Um, so make sure you come and join in the fun if you want to. The way you do that is go to patreon.com slash on three legs with the number three and you you join up at uh, the base level is two dollars a month and then depending if you want more you can you can commit to being a, a high level patron entirely up to you. Uh, you don't have to at all you can still enjoy all the free stuff. I will never stop doing the free stuff. It is just a way for me to start to uh, be able to leverage off of the channel, build a community, and then uh, bring you more content. My goal, if you go through my goals, you'll see I actually have a goal to do it full time and have a team. Uh, maybe it's a dream, I don't know, but I'd love to. I'd love to do this full time and have a team of people that are just helping me uh, put together you know, entertaining content that's helpful and educating. And I'm actually going to call myself a, an edutainer. <laughs> an edutainer. Uh, because I know... Um, People enjoy the vlogs, and I, I love doing the vlogs, uh, but I know people learn a lot from them, so it's pretty cool. It's a cool thing to do. All right, um, the final thing. Hey, there's Jeff. G'day, Jeff. Jeff jumped in. Uh, the final thing for everybody is, whilst you're in the chat box, use this as an opportunity to meet each other, share your links, let people know your Instagram, your Facebook, your 500 pics, your uh, Flickr, whatever it is, put it into the chat box, um, that way we can share the love and other, uh, you know, uh, Pixel Chatter participants can uh, can check out your social media. Put it in the chat box. It's your chance to uh, to connect with each other. Um, and if I were, you know, somebody asked me, it was that interview I did with um, with Joe Valencia, asked me about what my greatest achievement was in photography. And it's not about winning a competition. It's not even about getting a certain photo. It's about the fact that I get emails pretty much daily now from people thanking me for the fact that I've inspired them, I've motivated them, I've taught them something. Um, to me, that's my greatest achievement. And the fact that I'm connecting everyone together um, is such a good thing. Such a good thing. All right. I'm just reading these notes. George says, could the photographer gave taken a shorter photo or have taken a shorter photo of if waterfall and just added a touch of blur um you can it's difficult to do to add blur afterwards i always with the waterfall water's always moving fast on a waterfall gravity is dragging it down so i always say try a try and do a one or a two three second exposure if you can um, and you'll get good results uh, and you won't lose a lot of the detail Alrighty. So if you've got anything else to add, there we go. Susan has just said life's sparkle photography is her Insta. No waterfalls yet. <laughs> That's okay. Go and uh, connect with Susan on Insta. Who else we've got there? This is your chance. Share your links in the chat box and let everybody know. All right. Well, that's it for this week's show. Just a reminder, next week's Pixel Chatter will be on uh, Sunday. Stay safe in Perth. Apparently there is some wild weather. I'm glad it's not when I'm coming. Um, I'll be over there in early September, Barracuda. So maybe we should uh, hook up if we can. Um, I was going to try and hook up with Tommy last weekend, but we were just that little bit too far apart, so it didn't happen. Um, but if I'm ever out and about and I can hook up with anybody, if you see me on my way to near where you live, uh, feel free to reach out and see if we can uh, touch base. Um, the good thing about my trip to Perth is I'm going to be there for a week, so I'll have a little bit more of a chance to do what I need to do. 
Um, my trip up north was a little bit rushed. <laughs> so there you go. All right, once again, thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you give it a thumbs up and uh, share it out there. Share it with your friends and um, you know get as many people as we can coming along to Pixel Chatter. And the last thing I'll say is it's time for you to get out there with your camera and take some photos. See you next week.